சிறவை அஸ்லாம் வலைக்கம் அஹமது முபாரக் ஹாஸ் எவ்ரி ஒன் டூயிங் இன்ஷா வெல் ஹோப்பிங் and that everybody is doing well during this uh, pandemic we are social distancing like we're supposed to be doing and inshallah growing uh coach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh this is what Ramadan is all about i hope you guys were able to get your answers in for the questions that we had last week uh inshallah we will add one more question today we're moving on with the life of Umar ibn Khattab and we left off with him migrating from uh, Mecca to Medina and we said that Umar was very public about his leaving you know he, he came out and he said to everyone look you know i'm leaving now you know, he had his bow and he had his arrows and he said if anybody wants to make their wives widows their mothers crying and 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 their and their, and their sons or and their children orphans meet me follow me you know as if you know i can arrange that for you you know you're not going to do anything and so and we know that you know uh that he indeed left and nobody tried him like that uh, they said a few people uh in mecca the, the fools of mecca they said tried him and they quickly learned a lesson so we know that umar was able to leave publicly he was one of the few people who was able to leave publicly and so umar uh reaches uh Medina and we know that once the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam managed to reach Medina uh he established a khuwa a brotherhood between people who were from Mecca and people who were from uh, Medina and the people who were from Mecca these people were called um these people were called muhajirun and the muhajirun are the people who are you know uh the, the muhajir the people who are are migrating and uh leaving from you know a, a one home to 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 the land of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam which was medina and the people of medina were called the ansar or the helpers the ones who helped the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and so the prophet created this bond of brotherhood uh with the people uh who were from mecca who were then taken in by the people from Medina. And what we what we see uh in some of the, some of the most beautiful stories that we, we we see in this time. One of the stories we hear is about a, a family, uh, a man who didn't have enough food for instance. Yeah, I'm just trying to explain that the, the the setting and the scene. He didn't have enough food for his guest. And he's he's from Medina, he's one of the Ansar. So he makes sure that when they eat dinner they eat in darkness his family right and he serves the food that he did have which was only enough for his family he gave it to the people the muhajirun the people who came uh, who were traveling and so he gave them the food and they're faking subhanallah they're faking like they're eating food in the dark as to not alarm or upset their guests while their guests are eating the actual food So these are the type of stories we were hearing about this time you know just amazing uh efforts of of love and brotherhood and 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 making brothers uh, and, and sisters feel like you are welcome we will take care of you and so Omar uh had an interesting uh, you could say pact with uh, the person that he stayed with and so what they would do is one of them would work one of them would work all day long while the other one agreed to stay with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and learn from him right and then at night when they were both together the person who stayed with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he would teach the other and they would switch off like this so one would do all the work while the other one was with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam learning and then they would switch and the other one would then stay with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and learn and while the other one is working and this is the arrangement that Umar had And so Omar while he was in Medina uh he wanted to soak up as much as knowledge as possible from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We said that Omar was 
a scholar, it was someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed with uh, the ability to write, the ability to read. Uh, he, he was very well versed in poetry. He knew a lot about poetry. Uh, Umar was, was a scholar of his day. And so, of course, he would want to get from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as much as information as possible. And so uh, we have some uh, a few hadith uh, from Umar that I, I think it's really important for us to narrate. This is show you uh, where his mind was at, uh, how how you know how much he was definitely trying to learn from the Prophet And uh, this is uh, listed. These are uh, a, a group of hadith that are found in Bukhari that Umar ibn Khattab is mentioning. And so the first of these, for instance. Uh, comes from in the time of uh, Umar, when he was a Khalifa, once a Jew said, and Umar is talking about himself, he said, once a Jew said to me, oh, the chief of believers, there's a verse in your holy book, which is read by all of you, meaning the Muslims, and it had been revealed to us, and if it and, and had it been revealed to us, we would have taken that day on which it was revealed as a day of celebration. Umar ibn Khattab asked, which is this verse? The Jew replied, this day I have perfected your religion for you, completed my favor upon you, and have chosen for you Islam as your religion. Umar replied, no doubt. We know when and where this verse was revealed to us, or to the Prophet Sallallahu it was Friday, and the Prophet was standing at Arafat. Doing Hajj. So Umar, right, uh, is recalling, you know, the verse. He's again, he's a scholar. He's recalling the verse and he's talking about when it was revealed. And, uh, you know, it just, it just shows how much Umar was about, you know, his studies and about the, the deen and knowing and, and learning. Um, aside from that, there's other, uh, other hadith. A, a famous hadith that we know of is the hadith of Jibreel, right? We know that Umar is the, the, the one who relates this hadith of us, right? Where Jibreel alayhi salam comes and he questions the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam about three different things. And this hadith, uh, you know, we, we learn that our aqidah, our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our understanding of, of Islam and uh, Iman and Ihsan, all of that is wrapped up in this one hadith, right? And Umar is the, the one who is reporting this. So he's soaking up all of this knowledge, right? Umar even said once, and this is a very interesting hadith, and it tells you a lot about Umar and the way he carried himself and, you know, just how thoughtful he was. Umar said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala agreed with him on three occasions. The first of which he said that Umar came to the Prophet ﷺ one time and he said to the Prophet, ﷺ, he said, you know, we should face uh or he said we should face towards the maqam of Ibrahim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then revealed a verse uh agreeing with Umar in this particular particular uh case. And so this was the first occasion about uh uh, having the maqam, uh, the, the station of Ibrahim is a place to pray, and then the second, uh, the second time is uh, Omar said that our women should uh, cover themselves because sometimes they might be speaking to men who have bad intentions or have good intentions, and then surely enough, after this, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala have revealed the verses about hijab and our sisters covering, right? So before before this before this particular uh, moment. Uh, our women didn't necessarily cover themselves, but Umar was speaking ahead of his time before the, the, the actual ayah came down. He was talking about this, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala agreed with him. And on a, and the last occasion is when <clears throat> the Prophet sallallahu had a disagreement. Not a disagreement. His wives uh, were feeling some type of jealousy. And, and why not, right? They're human beings, and we have to remember this, that the Sahaba were not... They were not impervious to making mistakes. They were they were human beings. And you know, the Prophet ﷺ is the greatest of men. He is the greatest of people who ever existed. You know, and so naturally they would want to have more of his time, more of his affection, more of his love. And so the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, had some some issues where they they were making 
difficulties for the Prophet Sallallahu And Umar walked up to them and he told them, he said, you know, you all need to stop this. Otherwise, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala can easily get rid of you and find better wives for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And surely enough, ayat came down uh, speaking exactly what Sayyidina Umar was saying. So Umar is mentioning these moments in which Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala agreed with his thinking, right? Agreed with his understanding. Uh, another case, another time uh, that this happened is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now, this is a man in, in our in our seerah that we know of, his name is Abdullah ibn Ubay, and this man was <clears throat> uh, someone who was considered to be the chief of the hypocrites. He was known, he was a known hypocrite, it was it was not something, I'm an Afrik, this is not something that was was uh, news to anybody, they know they knew about him. And so he passed away. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is leading his funeral procession. He's he's in the head. He's about to, you know, uh, start the janazah for Abdullah ibn Ubay. Umar steps in front of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and and I want you guys to, to 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 think about this for a second. You know, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the prophet of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Umar steps in front of him. And he doesn't see Omar again. Remember, he is Al Farooq, the one who is able to distinguish between right and wrong. And so he steps in front of the Prophet وسلم, and he says, You know, this man, he fought against you. This man, he started this against you. This man created this problem and that problem. And he was just listing things over and over and over again, basically asking the Prophet, Why would you pray on such a person? Why are you praying on such a person? You know, this man did not believe in your way. And so Omar did not think it was appropriate for the Prophet ﷺ to, to be praying on this man's body to the extent that the Prophet told Omar to move, like move out of my way. And then he says to Omar, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that regardless if you pray for these types of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive them. Even if you pray 70 times for them and ask for forgiveness for them 70 times, he says, if I know that asking Allah 71 times would cause some type of forgiveness for this man, then I have, then I should do it. This is, was the, the opinion of the Prophet Sallallahu Look how much rahmah our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted for people. You know, these were people who were, were, were hateful towards him, who despised him, who wanted him to fall, who wanted him to fail, who hated the fact that he was who he was, yet and still, because he indeed is a mercy to mankind. Our Prophet Sallallahu wanted people, he wanted them to have the, the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And, and again, that reminds me of a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, if you knew what I knew, you would, you would laugh less and you would weep more. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had an understanding and he was, he, was, he was able to see certain things that other people just were not. Uh, they were not introduced to. He, they, they didn't have his vision. They didn't have his his perspective. And so the Prophet has 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 seen things that we can only imagine. And so he's telling them, move out of my way. And then Omar kept per persisting. And finally, Ayat came down, uh, actually siding with with uh, with Omar, and and telling the Prophet that this is not appropriate. And so and but this is this is also to to to. It's important to mention that Amr was not, he was not disrespectful. Like some people might hear that and think that Amr is, uh, who is he? You know, this is the Prophet Sallallahu this is Amr. No, Amr was not, Amr was not disrespectful. Amr, Amr loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He loved the Prophet more than himself. You know, this is something uh, that, that Umar, the, the Prophet Sallallahu was so beloved to Amr, and we're going to talk about that towards the end. But... To, to bring it on home for you, right? There's another time where the Prophet وسلم, was faced with a difficult situation. And this situation is during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And the Muslims went, uh, they wanted to go for Umrah uh, to, to Mecca. You know, at this point, so many battles had passed. And, uh, you know, from, from Badr to Uhud to Khandaq, and it was getting very serious. And so the Muslims wanted to go and uh, make Umrah. And they were met by resistance 
from the people of Mecca to the point that they're waiting on the outskirts to, to go into Mecca and they're sending delegates to the Muslims. And to make a long story short, uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was signed where the Muslims were, were going to be forced to go back home and then it could come the following year. But it was 10 years of peace, no fighting. And although in the beginning this was a, a treaty that the Muslims didn't necessarily want and they felt like they had to give up so much just to have this treaty, the Prophet saw himself benefit in it. And Umar was not one of the individuals who was completely happy with what they had to give up. You know, they felt somewhat disrespected. And so Umar goes to the Prophet وسلم, at the end of this and he says, Ya Rasulullah, didn't you promise us that we would be able to go and make Umrah? The Prophet وسلم, said, did I promise you this year? Umar said, no. And he said, then be patient. It's going to happen. It will happen. And so it wasn't enough for Umar. So Umar then went and he went to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and he said the same thing to Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr had a beautiful response. And he, he likened uh, Umar to the stirrups of the horse. The stirrups are, are the things that you stick your feet in when you're when you're riding uh, on, on the uh, saddle of the horse, the thing you stick your feet in to, to basically make sure you don't fall off and stay balanced. Uh, Umar, uh, Abu Bakr said to Umar, he said, stick to the stirrups of the Prophet Wasallam." Meaning stick to his side, stay close to his side, do not deviate from him. He is the messenger of Allah. We hear and we follow him. That's what we're here for. And Umar, I guess, hearing from Abu Bakr Siddiq, his point of view and what Abu Bakr had to say, Umar felt ashamed. And so, and this is what I'm talking about, right? That Umar, in this case, he did step in front of the Prophet and he had his issues and he and he and he presented them. Uh, and but then he realized that he was in the wrong. So what did he do? Listen to this. This is beautiful. Ahmad said, when he's he's the one narrating what happened, he said, and until this day, so whenever that happened, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, until up until whatever point it was in, in history, obviously sometime after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, perhaps years, who knows. But he says, and until this day, I have freed slaves, I fast, and I give charity to make up for that particular uh, mistake, for that sin. And remember what we said, right, about uh, the first the first class that Shaytan says about Umar, that, or that when uh, Shaytan sees Umar on one path, Shaytan goes the other way, right? He doesn't even want to confront Umar, right? Because of things like this. When Umar makes a mistake, Umar doesn't just say, oh, yeah, Allah, forgive me. I'm, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. He takes the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he says, when you make a mistake, you blot out that mistake, right? You remove that mistake with a good deed, right? And, you know, I look at it like this, like, subhanAllah, Omar saw his actions to be worthy of freeing a slave and fasting and giving sadaqah just to blot out that mistake and to do it until this day, meaning to do it for the rest of his life, just so that that's something that gets erased. I mean, this was Omar. You know, and people have to really realize how, how, uh, how much he cared about his akhirah and how much uh, he respected the Prophet how much he loved the Prophet and uh, this is something that you know some lessons that we need to take from Allah. Um, moving on uh, to the next stage, and Umar was like this throughout his time in Medina. You know, this was the way he was, and uh, he was he was like a security guard for the Prophet sallam. And it is said about Umar that he had this ability that was called firasa where he could look at a person just by looking at them and something in their 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 appearance, the way they are in their face is truly an art fit also. And he could tell you things about that person that were specific to that person. Uh, and on a couple of occasions, uh, Omar had to do that or he, he had fit also or foresight uh, to see when dangerous men were coming. Uh, there one time, there was one time this this one man who came to visit the Prophet Sallallahu but it was in his intention to harm the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had made a secret pact with someone by the Kaaba before he came to Medina, uh, and the pact was that he was going to assassinate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, uh, 
and he was worried about his daughters and the man who he made the pact with said, we'll take care of your family. Don't worry about it. So he left and he came and he came on the, on the, on the guys that he was coming to free uh, one of his relatives who got captured uh, from a war. And the prophet Salawai, I want to seize him coming. Right. And when I want to seize him, he ties the man up. He says, this man right here is up to no good. You know, he was able to see that in his, in his, in his behavior. And he brings him to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu tells him how he made this secret pact by the Kaaba. Nobody knew about it, only him and the man who he made the pact with. And so this was something that uh, caused the man to say, nobody knew about this. How do you know about it, Ya Rasulullah? And on the spot, he became Muslim, right? But these are just, I'm just saying this story to let you know that Amr was, you know, that's his capabilities. Those are the type of things he did. So anyway. As we said uh, when we were talking about Abu Bakr Siddiq, uh, the sadness of the death of the Prophet Sallallahu that it was such a sad time that Medina uh, and the land was was just was struck and hit hard with uh, with true sadness and sorrow. And I would say that no one was more hit hard than than Omar. He was hit so hard. Omar was walking the streets with his sword by his side, telling people, anyone who says that the prophet passed away, you know, literally that they 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 that's that's those are statements of hypocrisy and that the Prophet وسلم, is not dead. He left like Musa السلام, and he'll be back. And this is our prophet, and he was just emotional. Emotional. You know, his beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. And so it was, as we know, uh, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq who came back and brought Omar down and, and realized and Omar realized at this point that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did indeed pass away. Now we know all about the life of Omar and we hear how tough Omar was. We hear all these stories. There's one story that's that Omar even had to pay uh, blood money uh, because you know, Amr was a, is, he was a strong figure and he had strength that emanated from his presence. And one day he was walking with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he turned and, and, and when he turned, a woman who was walking behind them, she was so frightened by the, the, the force and the ferocity that she saw in him, she actually miscarried. Okay, this is the, uh, a, a story that people often tell just to, just to show how strong Amr was. And of course, he, he ended up paying blood money for this and uh, this mistake. It wasn't necessarily something that he, he did on his own, but Ahmad, again, he's about justice. And so now this strong figure, this powerful figure decides to, now he's, now he's, uh, he's, he's the, the wazir or the, uh, the, the advisor of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So when Abu Bakr is not there, Ahmad is the number two guy. And so now, so now Omar, who was this supporter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is now, uh, you start to see him take on a more political stance, a more, uh, he starts to take on leadership roles as he's preparing, as he also is preparing for his time that's going to come, inshallah. And we're going to talk about his time uh, next, next class. We're actually going to spend two classes on his time because uh, Omar had 10 years where he was the uh, Khalifa. And just so many beautiful stories about his time as the Khalifa. So, you know, with Abu Bakr Siddiq, he was he was strong. He was also strong for Abu Bakr because Abu Bakr's personality was different. Abu Bakr had a very loving, patient, peaceful personality. But Omar, just like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was learning from Abu Bakr. He was learning how to be a statesman. He was learning how to be a politician or someone who was in charge of the affairs of the ummah. He was learning how to do that. And, you know, we get all of these wonderful stories about him uh, helping people. Inshallah, we're going to get to that. I'm, I'm really excited about that. Um, so that's it for today's class. Uh, I got to give you guys the, the question, right, the question uh, for today. Uh, we will pick, let's see. I'll give you a hadith narrated by Umar, and then inshallah, uh, you should have this hadith memorized. This is, this is a bit of a harder question, 
but we'll have this hadith memorized uh, as one of the answers. Okay, so Omar says, I heard Hisham bin Hatim bin Huzam reciting Surah Al Furqan in a way different to that of mine. Allah's Apostle had taught it to me in a different way. So I was about to quarrel with him doing the prayer, but I waited till he finished. Then I tied his garment around his neck and seized him by it and brought him to Allah's Apostle and said, I have heard him reciting Surah Al Furqan in a way different to the way you taught it to me. The Prophet Sallallahu ordered me to release him and asked Hisham to recite it. When he recited it, Allah's Apostle Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it was revealed in this way. He then asked me to recite it. When I recited it, he said, it was revealed in this way also. The Quran has been revealed in seven, diff in seven, in seven different ways. So recite it in the way that it's easiest for you. This is a beautiful hadith, beautiful hadith. One, it shows us, uh, it, it tells us so much, right? It tells us, one, how serious Umar took the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being recited in a way that was not correct. Even though it was correct, Umar just didn't know. But he heard it, and he heard it to be incorrect, and he was ready to fight the person, Right? that the words were recited in such a way. But Omar waited, and then he sees the man, and he took him to the Prophet Sallallahu This is how serious the Quran is, and this is how serious we should take the Quran, right? In the sense that when we recite it, we recite it as perfectly as possible. We, we, don't, we don't mesh the words of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala up. These are his words, so we should take them and take them seriously. And so then, Omar, right, we learned that there's actually seven different ways of reciting the Quran. So I want to know, the question for this is from the hadith, right? One, how many ways, uh, how many ways is the Quran uh, able to be recited? And here we hear seven ways, right? There's seven qirat of the Quran, right? Seven. And then I want to know which surah that he was listening to in the particular hadith. And we said it is Furqan, right? So seven, seven qirat in the surah, which is Furqan. This is for the next question of this week, right? So Monday, Monday's question, I just said it to you, inshallah. And lastly, tomorrow we will start the exciting uh, stuff about Omar and his um, and his khilafah soon, inshallah. Thank you, everybody. I hope every everyone is enjoying their Ramadan. Uh, continue being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take advantage of this time. Read as much as Quran as you can. And definitely uh, take advantage of the, the salah at night. Uh, unfortunately, we're not here in the masjid. That doesn't that shouldn't stop you from being able to pray tarawih at home. In fact, we have an interesting uh, tidbit that we're going to mention later on about tarawih because it's related to Umar. So we'll talk about that later, inshallah. Thank you, everyone. And may Allah bless you. Remember Allah and get better, get stronger, become better Muslims, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.